What's going on, you guys? It's your Huggable Hipster here, and welcome back to my channel. Today, we're going to be going over the psychology slash philosophy of letting go in terms of the age of fire in Dark Souls 1. Also, yes, I know I haven't posted a video in like two days. Sorry about that. It's just been nice during the holidays just to relax and take time with family and just be be one with thyself. It sounds so prophetic. It's like, oh, yes, be one with thyself. Praise the fire and sun and have merry with the... I've food. Also, you guys like the, the poster in the background? I thought, you know what? I am going whole hog into being a Souls and Souls-like creator. I need at least one Souls poster. And why not get it of the man himself, the king, the legend, Artorius of the Abyss. But in today's video, we're going to be going over the psychology slash philosophy of the Age of Fire in Dark Souls 1. The whole theme of Dark Souls 1 in a nutshell is never giving up, but knowing when to quit or when to let go. This is where we get this philosophical theme of letting go and understanding your purpose is for one thing within the game, because you as the player have to figure out what the story is of Dark Souls as you go on. You have to figure out what your purpose is as a hollowed. So when we talk about letting go, we're to we're talking about letting go in the most basic of emotional terms, whether that's letting go to your struggle, letting go to what your grander purpose is in a Souls game, whether that being in the Age of Fire or just letting go and giving in to another cycle, another hollowed player is going to come in. They might make the choice to ignite the bonfire once more, and then you have the cycle repeating itself over and over. But when it comes to the Age of Fire, you're stopping the cycle, right? And this can be in terms of your own personal struggle. It can be in terms of stopping the cycle with depression. It could be in terms of so many different things. As we go on through the game in Dark Souls 1, there's this overarching theme of conversing with the different NPCs and understanding their viewpoint and understanding their struggle, their stories, why they didn't just let go in the right in like just the correct way. Because we see all of these really sad stories in Firelink Shrine of all of these different characters who are like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I need to do this. It's a story of struggle. It's a story of promising themselves something, but giving themselves a different story entirely than they had thought. Even when we meet the first uh, guy who seems a little bit shady in Firelink Shrine, right? We see that at towards the end of the game, he turns into a hollowed. He turns into the very thing that we are fighting against consistently with gaining humanity and gaining more of a presence and more of an awareness in what we are and who we are in the game. Our character may be a hollowed, but it's a very self-reflective character because you see throughout item descriptions, you see throughout uh, NPC dialogue interactions, there's so many self-reflective moments that a hollowed will go through. That's why as a hollowed, we look exactly like everyone else, but we get attacked because everyone knows that we're trying to find the way in which we can kind of ascend to humanity, ascend to that humanhood that we are looking for in the game. And when we get to that humanhood, we get stopped by none other, the you know, the main boss himself, the king, the person who is literally stopping progression from happening. This repetition, do we continue, you know, to give ourselves to the flame and hope that another hollow it is going to break the cycle? Or do we just say, you know, screw it, we're just going to go into the age of fire, the age of mankind, and go into this cycle in a new way? <laughs> because there's always going to be a cycle. There's always going to be a cycle. Even if you're going into the age of man and you're breaking one cycle, a new cycle will begin. The age of man is one of the most interesting concepts in a video game I've ever seen, of where we have this idea that going into something else will break what we already have. We still carry ourselves with us, and this is, can be true for real life as well, of where it doesn't matter what state you move to, it doesn't matter what home you go into, it doesn't matter what you're doing with your life, it's you that needs to change, not the environment, not the surroundings. It's very dependent on how you are viewing the world, how you are portraying yourself throughout your journey in the world. That's why I always I always think, you know, no matter where you go, it's the person that makes the home. It's not the home that makes the person. Now, it's really interesting because when we interact with Gwyn and we see his story, how everything in his background went, he sacrificed himself to the flame, 
thus keeping the cycle going. If the player decides to do that, they're just keeping the flame progressing and they're basically uh, taking place of Gwyn. They're the next, you know, fire bearer. They're the next king. But as we see in different Souls games, from Dark Souls 2 into Dark Souls 3, the prolonging of the flame, the prolonging of something and keeping something in which isn't meant to stay kept. It's kind of like keeping something just because you don't want to let go. And that goes back to the original concept for this video, right? The age of man, the age of dark is a letting go. It's kind of a rebirthing process for humanity. Gwyn didn't want to let that go. He didn't want to let go and go into something new. Why? Because fear of change. Fear of change is something that people can relate to IRL. People, you know, always fear change. A lot of people have a fear of change because it's something unpredictable and it's something we cannot control. We can control it somewhat, but you know, change for the most part, whenever it's something healthy or whenever it's something that's out of our control, that's when it gets into, you know, really kind of weird territory and it gets into scary territory, especially if you like are a person that's not used to change or doesn't want to change. This is why at the very end of Dark Souls 3, we kind of see a distortion of the sun of where it starts to turn into the dark sign itself. And at the, uh, at the end of Dark Souls 3, we kind of see this amalgamation of everything that the first three games has brought to this point of how disastrous it is to keep the first flame going unnaturally for this long. And then by the end of Dark Souls 3, the final boss, at least for me personally, I didn't look at the lore on this, but for me personally, I believe the final boss to be a personification, if you will, of the bonfire itself. That way you are fighting the actual first flame. I just get excited talking about this stuff. It's just still like the lore of Dark Souls and the way that it's presented to the player. It's in such an organic way that you're seeing the growth of humanity across three games. You're fighting a bonfire in the fight in the final game basically because i don't think there is going to be any more dark souls games after uh, after this <laughs> after dark souls 3 i feel like the story kind of just organically you know went its way i was like okay you know the player got what they got out of this and that's good knowing when to let go whether it's in a game or in real life is very crucial to one's existence because when you know how to let go in a healthy way that is beneficial to your growth it means all the world and it makes all the difference in how you survive and how you go into the age of fire. Guys, that was it for today's episode of Psychologically Gaming. I hope you all enjoy this. Tomorrow's video is going to be a bit interesting because I've been planning this one for a hot minute. We're going to be going over the story of Bloodborne for beginners. So expect that tomorrow. The next day, we're going to be going into another uh, psychology of souls games of where we're going to be discussing NPCs and why I believe they are the collective consciousness of the player. Then we're going to do some Lords of the Fallen and some Dark Souls 2, because I'm really honestly, I'm you'll have to let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or even in the community posts that I made, because I really want to be able and I don't want to burn myself out more than anything. I don't want to burn myself out. But I want to be able to do playthroughs of both Lords of the Fallen and Dark Souls 2. I don't want to do live streams for both of them because that can get rather chaotic. And plus, I love editing videos, so I would love to be able to just sit down and do that. Um, I know a few of my friends are, are playing Dark Souls 2 for the first time, <laughs> so it's interesting to see their journey and see where they are with things. Uh, we just got past the Lost Sinner in the last Dark Souls 2 live stream that I did. So I'm trying to figure out whether I want one of them to just be a playthrough, one of them to be a live uh, a live stream. I'm really tempted to just do both as a recorded playthrough. So if you see those, but you guys, that is it for today's video. Since I did not post um, for the past two days previous, there are going to be videos over the weekend to make up for that. If you guys like my face and what I do, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell down below. I make videos every weekday here on YouTube. May you find your worth in the waking world, dear hunter. Stay casually nerdy, and I will see you all in the next video. Umbasa.